I want to uh, also say my gratitude to the Dubai Institute for giving me this opportunity to uh, at, at, at mostly a home audience, I think, um, give you an update on our latest results on self-assembly. And it's about self-assembly on multiple length scales. And um, a platform that we are uh, developing to do that, and that is from uh, all the way from the atomic length scale to the nanoparticle length scale and to the wavelength length scale of light, uh, we use self-assembly in slowly drying droplets. Uh, we do that because that gives us an opportunity to stop the self-assembly at a predetermined uh, length scale of the droplet size. And by playing both with the number of particles in the droplet and or uh, uh, the size of the droplets, we thus have control over um, multiple uh, length scales. And these um, supraparticles that then result, for instance, um, by using nanoparticles that are very monodispersed, you can make uh, supraparticles that themselves are colloidal particles uh, as well. This, uh, where you see the laser pointer, this particle has a diameter of about 300 nanometers. So in principle, that supraparticle can be self-assembled again, because a very important um, aspect of uh, colloidal particles, and that's the, uh, uh, actually even tied to their definition, is that they can perform Brownian motion. And uh, that is just uh, another way of saying that they have a well-defined thermodynamic temperature. That means that colloidal Colloidal particles, um, if you know their interaction potentials, form the same equilibrium phases as atomic and molecular systems do. So on top of being very interesting for materials, they're also very interesting as model systems. Although I'm not going to treat um, a lot of confocal microscopy data, I do want to point out in my introduction that uh, we cannot now uh, a days not only um, self-assemble structures on multiple length scales, we can also, in real space, analyze them on multiple length scales. And this really now, and I think that is very exciting, is all the way from atomic uh, length scales, so finding the atoms in individual nanoparticles to um, the positions of these nanoparticles in uh, 3D structures, and then on multiple uh, further length scales by, uh, by light uh, microscopy. Already, and that is because colloids can be this powerful condensed matter model system, already uh, at the end of my PhD uh, research, we were trying to get confocal microscopy uh, to work on assemblies of colloidal particles of about a micron in size. And uh, that goes back all uh, most uh, 30 years, um, and uh, I do want to cover this uh, for uh, in the start because the knowledge that we obtained there was very useful later on in doing a real space analysis also by uh, electrons. And it will be very useful also in doing analysis on the atomic scale as well. So what is confocal microscopy? I can make it very brief by saying that essentially it's a spatial filter uh, where a point source of light is by a um, dichroic mirror focused all the way down and we make use here of um, the highest numerical aperture lenses that we can get and the numerical aperture is just a measure of the divergence uh, of the, the light beam so how tightly you can focus the light uh, the, the numerical aperture, the highest that you can get uh, is about 1.4. If you focus light that tightly, you get a diffraction limited spot with a diameter of about 200 nanometers. But what is also important is that all the light that is below or above the focal plane is strongly uh, discriminated against because we do not only use a point source, but also a point in the uh, detection scheme. So there is a, a pinhole also in front of the detector. To make a long story short, you have now only imaged one point. You have to scan um, either your sample or by using um, the dichroic mirror that can be moved uh, this point over a 2D plane. You can build up uh, images that way. And if you move the, the focal plane uh, or move the, uh, the lens, you can uh, get three-dimensional data. And because colloids 
could form these equilibrium phases, um, it really gave the opportunity if you combine it with making fluorescent particles that, for instance, have a fluorescent core and a non-fluorescent shell, um, it gave you the, the possibility of getting particle coordinates in 3D and then analyze structures um, on the single particle level. And almost all of you here are in the Dubai Institute, so I, I don't really need to explain to you that the ability to investigate structures in real space, um, be it atomic or on the nanoscale or on the uh, much bigger colloidal scale, is very important for properties because properties, uh, be it mechanic or optical, um, are determined to a large extent, not only by the regularity, but also by the defects. And so if there is like a missing particle like here, uh, seen here over here, that point defect uh, can cause some additional scattering or other properties that is very difficult to analyze if you rely on scattering methods because scattering methods are sensitive to the regularity, not to the irregularities. So that is a, a very good reason to also want to image uh, and analyze things on uh, the single particle level. So what we applied that to uh, first is a simple uh, colloidal spheres of about a micron in size. And this radial distribution function that you then can obtain in 3D can uh, tell you a lot about the phase behavior of these uh, systems. So that was about roughly uh, 25, 30 years ago. Let's now fast uh, forward a little bit and uh, go to what uh, are the present day possibilities also of confocal microscopy. We've uh, now got the ability to scan in 3D very, very fast. So I'm, I'm showing here a movie which uh, is actually a 3D data set, but I've projected it down so that it's easier to uh, visualize. We can now follow the um, translational and rotational diffusion of, for instance, these uh, silica fluorescent silica rods in 3D. And um, uh, that is being, has been made possible by very, very fast scanning uh, dynamics. So we can get full 3D data sets uh, in uh, now even a fraction of a second. This is already already uh, somewhat, somewhat old, older data. And by using um, point spread function engineering, we can also increase the, the resolution to below 100 uh, nanometers. So this allows us now uh, to also analyze systems that are much more complex than uh, spherical uh, particles. Here I show you just one example of rod-like particles that you probably know if the aspect ratio is large enough, form phases that are in between that of a crystal and a liquid. Here it actually forms a one-dimensional solid, a smectic phase where the rods are oriented in layers and the layers uh, are liquid-like, but the um, uh, the stack of the, the one dimensional stack is, is crystalline. So there is one dimensional order in this direction and still liquid like order in that direction. We were going here uh, in 3D through the sample. So you first saw uh, um, a gas of the, the rods, then a liquid, and then uh, you went into this uh, smectic uh, liquid crystal phase. That is about uh, what can be done now um, um, with light microscopy all the way down to resolutions below 100 nanometer. Also developed here in the Dubai Institute, and uh, that was actually uh, a collaboration uh, between um, three Dubai groups. Uh, it was led by the group of uh, Krein de Jong. Um, we were able to get positional coordinates also uh, using electron uh, imaging now, um, using transmission electron microscopy tomography. And here, uh, the, these, the wavelength uh, is of course much smaller, but more importantly, the numerical aperture is um, compared to confocal microscopy, you want the highest numerical aperture. Here, the electron beam has a very low numerical aperture. So it means that basically everything that you image of about a micron or, or, or even several microns is in focus. If you now tilt uh, this transmission electron microscopy image, you can get uh, 3D information by um, uh, analyzing the whole tilt series of these uh, tomograms. And um, in 2009, 
the groups uh, uh, or the, the work done by Heine Friedrich, but done in the group of uh, Krijn de Jong in a collaboration with the group of Daniel van Maaklebeg and a little bit of input uh, also uh, from our group was able to analyze uh, this binary beautiful crystal of uh, different size nanoparticles. Look at the space bar here, it's 20 nanometers. And this binary crystal was very complex. The simple cubic of the big particles uh, could easily be recognized also in scattering, but where all the small particles were was very much uh, impossible to determine by scattering. And only this, for the first time, uh, real space analysis doing electron microscopy tomography allowed that uh, 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 made that possible. So that's uh, on a binary system, uh, but if we fast forward to about five, six years uh, ago, we are now able to also analyze not only spherical uh, systems in electron microscopy tomography, but also rod-like particles. The space, the bar is here 50 nanometers. These are gold rods that now have self, uh, been self-assembled in slowly drying emulsion droplets. Um, and these gold rods are coated with a thin layer of uh, silica, so the electron beam passes through that relatively easily. And then all the orientations and the positions of the rods in this three-dimensional structure uh, could be analyzed. And that's uh, published in its work uh, that uh, Thijs Besseling and Michiel Hermes contributed uh, the most to, but there were a lot of people who, uh, who collaborated on this. So now we have gone to um, analyzing the structure of assemblies of nanoparticles that are of more difficult uh, shape. But what is very exciting, I think, and that is a work that was not initiated in the Dubai Institute, but in the University of Antwerp, uh, in the group of uh, Staf Tendelo and um, Sarah Balls, um, the ability to do this electron microscopy tomography also to obtain for crystalline samples at the moment only uh, the positional coordinates of all the atoms in a nanoparticle that has been made possible by this uh, pioneering group of the University of, of Antwerp together with uh, several uh, other groups. And already uh, a few years ago, Wiebke Albrecht, in collaboration with the group of Sarah Balls, determined um, for single crystalline gold rods, these are rods of about 70 nanometers in, in length, all the atomic uh, positions in this nanoparticle. Then Wiebke hit this gold uh, rod particle with a femtosecond laser beam, and um, by heating it up on a very short time scale, this uh, crystal, uh, this particle stayed crystalline, but the aspect ratio changed. And um, what has now been um, analyzed fully and also supported uh, by a very nice uh, molecular dynamic simulations of this very complex um, um, reorganization, atomic reorganization. Uh, this paper is just accepted uh, in advanced uh, materials and you can uh, read about uh, details of that uh, shortly uh, because the uh, movies were very big. I'm only showing you here that we could indeed analyze that the, the particle, the gold rod before being hit by this femtosecond laser pulse, which heated up the, um, the gold rod to very high uh, temperatures, 1000 degrees for a very short time. That, that enormous uh, thermal pulse uh, created not only that the aspect ratio reduced of, the, of this gold rod, but additionally, that all kinds of stacking errors uh, became um, visible in this uh, crystal. And these stacking um, errors already caused the plasmonic response of that uh, nanoparticle to be changed. And what is very exciting, I think, is that uh, mostly due to um, Marijn van Huys, we now have in Utrecht also a double aberration corrected microscope with which we, which we can do the, the full analysis of these atomic structures of single nanoparticles as well. And in addition, measure the plasmonic response with high resolution uh, EELS uh, measurements uh, as well. So these uh, are uh, examples of that we can now, uh, and I think this is this is very exciting, image where all the atoms are in a nanoparticle, where all the nanoparticles are in assemblies, and where all the assemblies are in bigger uh, still uh, colloidal uh, structures. So there is not only uh, a big improvement of 
on the self-assembly, but also big improvements on the real space analysis of all these uh, structures. Just a few words and a, a few brief examples of why do we want to do to have this ability to structure at actually multiple length scales? Because structuring on the atomic length scale itself is already very exciting uh, um, uh, uh, as well. Uh, most of you probably know the very famous um, uh, talk that was given by Richard Feynman. He's my personal hero uh, in, in physics. He gave a talk in uh, the American Physical Society in 1959 and he was kind of daydreaming what all would be possible if we could build up materials atom by atom and then even connect different atoms uh, uh, together on um, on a atom by atom basis and and the quote that that is used often by people working in nanoscience there's plenty of room at the bottom uh, uh, was the partial title of this uh, this talk uh, it did not set off the nanoscience uh, revolution, as is often said, but people rediscovered this talk and found a lot of inspiration uh, from it. As a matter of fact, um, uh, this, this building up uh, materials atom by atom uh, was realized by uh, the scanning tunneling microscope and people from IBM in the end of the 80s and early 90s. And uh, this is work that continues in beautiful work of uh, Ingmar Swart and uh, Daniel van Maeklenberg, where they not only, so like the, the, the work of the early 90s of the IBM group made a quantum chorale, so atoms placed on a metal uh, surface. Um, and the whole point of, of this talk is that I uh, would like to extend uh, the, the daydreaming of Richard Feynman, not only at the bottom, but that if you can structure not only all where the, all the atoms are, but but structure differently at different length scales, that there is then even much more room uh, to manipulate uh, properties. So this daydreaming was picked up by IBM researchers, as I mentioned, but also in the group of Ingmar Swart. Uh, this has been beautifully uh, still uh, ongoing work, where not only these quantum corals, which are kind of model systems, quantum model systems for atomic systems are now uh, combined. Uh, these quantum corals are strongly combined. Uh, so what, what you're actually looking at here is the wave functions of the electrons um, when they're scattered of atoms placed on the surface of a metal. Um, and, and this is not only an, a model for an atom, but here truly uh, a quantum material and then in this case, it's a quantum material with, with no properties because this is a self-repeating structure. You probably uh, recognize some of the Sierpinski triangles that uh, uh, are not do not have any equivalent, I think, in, in nature, but are very interesting to study what is do these strongly coupled uh, wave functions uh, do. But we cannot only make uh, models of uh, quantum uh, atomic systems by placing atoms, in this case it's uh, carbon monoxide on, on copper, I think, uh, surfaces, we can also make very tiny semiconductor particles where the particle size is of the same order as, as the wave function that is um, associated with an electron hole pair that you can generate in such uh, semiconductors. If you bring those kind of quantum particles or artificial atoms, if you want, uh, closely together, and this is beautiful work uh, from the group of Daniel van Maeklenberg. They brought these individual quant single crystalline um, uh, lead selenide quantum dots not only so close together that the wave functions overlapped, but they brought them so close together that the crystalline lattices and the ligands uh, disappeared. There is a lot of detail there that I'm skipping over, but the ligands were washed away in, this, in the subphase in which the self-assembly was done and you end up with a material that has holes uh, the size of several nanometers, but has conductivity in the plane with this uh, beautiful hexagonal uh, symmetry, which is very reminiscent. And also the properties of this semiconductor are now very reminiscent of, for instance, graphene-like materials. So another example of how you can generate completely new kinds of materials with new properties, if you are able to, stru to structure them now on the length scale of several nanometers. 
another example of if you can structure atoms uh, almost at will, but then by doing physical chemistry, is the following example, and this is taken from a paper that will appear very soon in Nature Materials, and it's the collaboration with the group of Petra de Jong. Uh, this is work of Jesse van der Hoeve, who will, by the way, uh, return um, uh, to the Netherlands and to the Dubai Institute in the summer as a tenure tracker. And I forgot to mention that Wiebke Albrecht will next month uh, begin a tenure track as well, but now uh, at the FOM Institute Amolf, where I also worked for for nine years. So what did Jesse do? Jesse used uh, a synthesis method that was developed in our group uh, by Chan Song Deng for making very beautiful single crystalline gold rods. These were uh, overgrown by a mesoporous silica layer. And then because of this mesoporous silica layer, we were able to grow on top of the single crystalline gold rod different other metals. And in this case, uh, we chose palladium because it was known that uh, a bimetallic um, catalyst would be very beneficial for the hydrogenation of butadiene. And butadiene is um, a molecule with two double bonds, but we want to selectively hydrogenate uh, that molecule so that uh, it's a uh, contaminant actually in, in a monomer that is used in industry a lot, so that uh, this butadiene one double bond could, could be hydrogenated and then uh, the, the contaminant uh, is actually becomes the, the product. So this is a hydrogenation that you really want to stop at this one um, uh, reduction of, uh, of the double bond. And to make a long story short, you can find the details in this paper. We tested not only pure gold rods for this um, selective hydrogenation, but also um, palladium core shell rods and the uh, energy dispersive X-ray scattering plots that give the distribution of the elements are shown over here. So the, we made also core shell particles uh, of these gold rods uh, and also alloyed um, the gold uh, rods. It turned out that the pure gold or pure palladium particles uh, were less effective than the core shell geometry and also the core shell geometry was about 50 times more effective than the alloy rod as well. And density functional theory calculations actually show you why this, this is, but um, all the while we didn't lose any of the selectivity in the hydrogenation as well. So 50 times more um, activity, but the selectivity was, was still uh, still there. This just gives one tiny example of a huge parameter space that is still open to be explored in, in uh, bimetallic ternary metallic systems uh, to optimize properties, uh, in this case, uh, selective hydrogenation. Another example I, sh I showed before uh, from um, the work of Daniel van Maeklenberg, where you want to create strong coupling of the electron, uh, uh, the, the wave functions of the quantum dots. Uh, sometimes you actually do not want strong coupling um, of the neighboring quantum dots. So in this example, particles were generated, again, semiconductor particles, but this time they the, the core, um, the luminescent core was coated with uh, ever increasing band gap materials uh, on the outside of this uh, core particle. By doing that, you create, you make it such that the electron, um, the, the, the wave function, when even when two particles are in close contact, do not strongly couple. But um, the quantum efficiency of these particles and that they really have this core shell geometry can be seen in this EDX uh, on, on the right, when you put all these particles together in a, a superparticle, so a much bigger particle consisting now of hundred thousands of uh, of these these spheres, in that case the luminescence uh, is virtually uh, the same as that of the single uh, quantum dot. So they don't couple uh, strongly to to their neighbors quantum mechanically, but they do couple strongly to the properties of their neighbors as uh, is determined by the refractive index. So um, one application actually of 
uh, these superparticles, lum strongly luminescent superparticles, is that you can mix different color superparticles. So here, uh, semiconductors with different sizes and therefore different emission wavelengths uh, were combined. And then you can actually make um, um, white colored uh, materials. Um, that is not good. So the computer and my screen have hung up. Is that, oops, okay. Um, so we can, we can see you flicking through the slides. Okay, um, my screen uh, was hung up. So if you mix those three different um, color components, um, you can actually make white uh, emitting uh, particles relatively easily. And as you probably probably know, these kind of particles are used in, um, in, in relatively expensive televisions. But uh, processing superparticles, which are much larger, is much easier than the individual quantum dots. So uh, this ability is, is quite interesting for applications like that. And this is work done by Federico uh, Montanarella, uh, Montanarella, who was supervised both uh, by Daniel van Makelenberg and also partially in our group in collaboration with uh, Patrick Bajou. So these uh, uh, are superparticles where you just use the individual um, um, high efficiency quantum dots. But now if you make these superparticles larger because the, the refractive index of, of semiconductors is very large, you actually start to generate uh, strong optical resonances. So because of the high index of refraction, um, these particles, and uh, if I all the way zoom in, you can very vaguely see that uh, these are built up, uh, superparticles are built up of thousands and thousands of these semiconductor non-strongly quantum coupled uh, uh, quantum dots. Then uh, these resonances, which are called me whispering gallery modes, um, and, and which make a strong coupling of the optical modes, so not the quantum modes, but the optical modes, then start to uh, be important for the emission of the light of these particles. So this is a cathode uh, ray luminescence. So the, the zinc oxide rods here uh, are used for or are excited by the electron beam. And then uh, this is not a fake colored uh, image, but a real uh, light image that was uh, obtained in the electron microscope. But if we take a spectra of these superparticles, you start to see that on top of the broad emission peaks that are of the individual uh, quantum dots, you now start to have sharp peaks. And these peaks are, um, are, are caused by the difference in mode densities of the whispering gallery modes of the light of the strongly optically coupled uh, quantum dots. And um, if this coupling becomes so strong that you get a nonlinear enhancement, then you have basically created what you can also create by putting a, a laser die between two, um, uh, two mirrors. You can get very strong nonlinear coupling and then you can, can get light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, also uh, known as a laser. So if you make these uh, me resonances yet stronger than uh, not only are present in superparticles of a few micron, but of superparticles of 10 micron, then all of a sudden this relatively broad um, emission peak of the quantum dots now will only uh, specifically enhance uh, single modes, uh, resonant modes in, in such superparticles and you get lasing. And this work was published a couple of years ago and uh, analyzed together with uh, IBM Zurich uh, group and, and as I mentioned, done together with the group of Daniel van Makenberg. So now, I've shown you quite a few examples of why structuring on multiple length scales uh, can be quite important. Let's now go um, into this process on how we uh, are trying to develop this multiple length scale um, structuring. And putting dispersion droplets, uh, so putting colloidal particles in, in small droplets or dispersion uh, emulsion droplets is, is nothing new. Already 100 years ago, um, Pickering and Rams, Ramsden did this, uh, creating Pickering emulsions, uh, but also about 20 years ago, the group of Dave Pine uh, did this to create small um, 
uh, clusters of particles. Uh, before I actually go to uh, doing that self-assembly of the particles in the spherical confinement, uh, I first want to bring you to what many of you have already heard and, and know about, but for those uh, students who have not yet heard about it, I'll, I'll cover it as well. Um, colloids are not only important because they have this thermodynamic equilibrium temperature, but because we can manipulate their interaction potentials, we can create a potential that is in the atomic world um, not possible and only in a computer simulation. We can create by index matching particles uh, where the van der Waals forces are uh, compared to KT, the thermal energy negligible. And if uh, you do that and you also make particles, so these are for instance glass spheres with a diameter of a few hundred nanometers with uh, ligands on them on the order of uh, one and a half nanometer. So these ligands repel each other uh, when the particles meet but there are no attractions, so then you have a very steep potential, almost a hard sphere-like uh, potential. And in computer simulations, it was shown already at the end of the 50s, that such systems can show a first-order phase transition, and this is actually not trivial at all. We're now quite used to it in the Dubai Institute, but that um, if you don't have any attractions between uh, your uh, atoms or your uh, particles, then it's only entropy. So delta G is minus T delta S plus delta H. If delta H is zero, you only have minus T delta S. And um, it therefore means that only entropy, which often is associated with disorder, but not a completely correct description, uh, as you will uh, see, because if you increase the volume fraction of hard particles until about 50%, then a first order phase transition starts to happen and you uh, get crystals with a volume fraction that is 10% larger uh, to self-organize. And therefore, if you want to have a spontaneous process, it means that minus T delta S needs to be positive. And therefore, the entropy of this crystal needs to be larger than the entropy of the liquid. And that is counterintuitive because the ordered uh, crystal uh, you would associate uh, not with more disorder but with less. The reason why the entropy is still higher of that phase is actually that locally the uh, volume available for the particles, so notice that here the, the hard spheres are dried and then they are touching, that is 74 volume percent, but when this crystallization happens there is still about 10 percent of the radius around them available and that available volume can be used much more advantageously in the crystal than in the liquid phase. This is all talking uh, after the fact. Uh, it, as a matter of fact, when this was first reported on by computer simulators at a Gordon conference, a liquid Gordon conference, half of the professors there didn't want to believe that this was indeed uh, the explanation for the phenomenon. But nowadays, uh, almost all people uh, accept this. And the crystal that uh, then forms is actually a close-packed crystal. So close-packed planes that are stacked in a certain way. If you have a close-packed uh, plane, a hexagonal plane, you can stack the ne next one on top of it in the crevices. If you call that, that stacking AB, then there is a third way of stacking the third layer ABC. If you keep repeating that, it's face-centered cubic crystal, a uh, cubic uh, symmetric crystal. If you keep repeating it as A, B, A, B, it's hexagonally close-packed. The free energy difference between HCP and FCC is very close per particle. It's on the order of 10 minus 3 kT. That phase-centered cubic is actually um, the preferred phase, but often because it is such a small difference, you find randomly stacked uh, crystals. So that's the bulk phase behavior of hard spheres. Now we start uh, with the experiments that were done by Barton Nijs um, by slowly drying his nanoparticles in emulsion droplets. And I started already saying that um, putting dispersion droplets in um, or, or particles in emulsion droplets is nothing new. We, d we definitely didn't start it. Um, there's beautiful work of Dave Pine where he uh, found beautiful uh, clusters of particles when he dried uh, droplets uh, that way. The structuring there 
is determined a lot by all the drying forces um, and he analyzed the structures uh, with uh, the, the largest number being about 50 uh, particles. We go all the way to the other limit. We want to make structures from a few hundred to a few thousand to a few hundred thousand of uh, particles. So in this case, uh, there are particles at the interface, but most of the particles are in the interior and are then uh, crystallizing. So why do we want to do this with hard particles? Because in that way, entropy dominates and we can not only do our self-assembly with nanoparticles, but also with much bigger particles. So uh, nevertheless, Bart and I started uh, his work by doing it with nanoparticles. And Simone Dussi and Frank Smallenburg were very important in giving computer simulation support, uh, which was supervised uh, by Marjolein uh, Dijkstra. So there are very monodispersed iron oxide or iron cobalt oxide particles that uh, Bart uh, made, and those were self-assembled in uh, the slowly drying droplets. For very large number of particles, what you actually expect and, and, and do find uh, is face-centered cubic crystals. So that is completely like the bulk phase behavior. But Bart also found, um, and he did the first tomography on these uh, systems as well, so he had to develop, develop a lot of new work, he found weird defect planes in the particles and he said well i this this looks very very funny and it took quite a while to to actually find out what uh, we, we were looking at so i give you very brief intermezzo here on icosahedral ordering because it's it's very important for uh, all the, the structures that we we found subsequently if you have one sphere and 12 other spheres can then touch that sphere if you want to form the most close packed surrounding of one sphere with 12 other spheres, you get what is called an icosahedron. And that's the uh, structure uh, on the left here. If you measure locally the volume fraction of that structure, for instance, if you shrink wrap um, your uh, cluster of 13 particles and measure the volume, then the local volume fraction is actually higher than if you would arrange the particles such that they are part of the close packed structure. So this is kind of counterintuitive because uh, the icosahedral order does not have the closest packed structure of, um, of a 3D crystal. That is the close packed structure of either FCC or HCP. But locally, this icosahedral cluster is uh, the closest packed structures. And everybody knows um, truncated icosahedra because they are actually uh, the same as the soccer, soccer ball. And if you ever uh, uh, thought of why is that actually five fold symmetric, this soccer ball, that is because you can make the most spherical st regular structure uh, in, in that way. So locally, it was known that hard spheres uh, form icosahedral structures. And actually, Leonard Jones systems also do this because the argument that it's the highest density also optimizes the attractions between the Leonard Jones uh, molecules. But we were very much surprised to find out that this argument of locally closed packing, if you continue to add uh, more atoms uh, to your icosahedral structure, then the limit of the packing is not 74 volume percent, but it's actually 68 volume percent. So um, we were very surprised to find out that um, very large superparticles with uh, as much as tens of thousands of uh, hard spheres in them still had this five-fold symmetry, symmetry. So you, you've now been primed by the intermezzo, so you immediately recognize that this uh, structure that you see on the left here is actually a rhombi cozy dodecahedron. Uh, no, of course you didn't recognize that, but um, after analyzing a lot of these structures, we did uh, find out that this was a surface reconstructed icosahedral symmetry still, and that is why this five-fold symmetry is still there. We even found out that the icosahedral structures kept on going on until tens of thousands of particles. So then I, I said, well, it's probably because of attractions. Um, and I said, let's figure out and make the same structures from silica beads and PMMA beads that are much, much bigger, because if the interactions is hard, it shouldn't matter which forms. 
we had to wait weeks before the self-assembly to uh, to be uh, equilibrium wise but also for these very much larger colloids we found the uh, the icosahedral uh, structures then we started uh, uh, immediately uh, asking Marilyn Dijkstra if she could look in computer also what happened and the first uh, runs were done by uh, uh, Frank Smallenberg and indeed uh, these uh, rhombicosi dodecahedrons also popped up for similar kind of numbers of spheres. So to make a long story short we analyzed also the very big colloids and um, what is very very nice and a lot of work uh, from the group of Marlene uh, Dijkstra, Simone Dussi did a lot of work for that, she could actually show that indeed the free energy until about a hundred thousand particles of icosahedral structures is lower than that of the bulk crystal and only when you reach about a hundred thousand of particles will the bulk crystal uh, become the stable structure again in this spherical confinement. So this was um, well not um, not expected at all. What is now very nice is that these uh, particles were all done with 10 nanometer sized particles. Uh, if you scale it up to the optical wavelengths, fortunately we already mentioned this uh, in our paper as well, uh, these icosahedral structures would be very interesting for structural colors and uh, this is indeed the case. You don't see um, well, you see the same color from all different directions, and that is caused by this spherical sym symmetry of the icosahedral uh, structures that were just realized a couple of months ago in a collaboration between the groups of Fini Minahoran and the group of Moon. So now that those were spheres. What happens, and, and we were very much motivated to see if we could also get these icosahedral structuring happening if we could combine it with uh, directed attachment, as I showed in the 2D case of the semi 2.5D case of uh, Daniel van Maeklenberg. This is work, um, a lot of work of Da Wang. Uh, Michiel Hermes was essential for doing the uh, image analysis uh, and also some of the simulation work, uh, of which a lot was also done by Nick Tasios. And Rama Kotli made uh, very sharp cubes. So we made use of the fact that these iron oxide particles can not only be made as uh, relatively round single crystalline uh, spheres, but that they could also be made um, in either sharp cubes or rounded cubes. And the details are not important, but we defined a shape parameter where the shape parameter is zero for spheres and one for sharp cubes. And we then looked what is the self-assembly as a function of the shape uh, parameters. So what we found, and now again, sorry, uh, it went a little bit fast, is that for the sharper cubes, we got simple cubic ordering in the core of the superparticles and uh, on the outside, they kind of formed uh, the uh, layers that were following the surface tension of the, of the structures. What is interesting is we got very, very similar structures in the simulations and in the real space analysis that we performed of the tomograms of these uh, systems. We even had to take the tiny uh, extra roundedness of the ligands into account in the simulations to get a perfect uh, agreement. But these are not so interesting structures because simple cubic, uh, if you then do directed attachment and get rid of the ligands, for instance, by heating, you get one big clump of, uh, of the crystal and that's not very interesting. But if we br bring the shape parameter down from 0 0.8 to um, 0.3, and the presentation is still not progressing in my side, is the stream now going further or not? Stream is okay. Um, I don't see the um, the next slide in my uh, presentation. Um, I'm still hung with the alpha is point uh, eight on my. Uh, is that still what? Yeah. Is yeah, that's what we see. Yes. We see slightly rounded cubes. Yeah. So I want to go to. Um, to the defect structures and then the next one is alpha is 0.3. Uh, 
Um, and that is not progressing, so then let's just uh, try it in words and then see if the computer catches up, because otherwise I don't hope that we have to restart things. Uh, so for uh, particles with the point three, uh, so much more uh, rounded, but still with flat interfaces, we again got um, icosahedral symmetry, but then by analyzing also the orientations of neighboring particles, we found out that the neighbors were still oriented with the crystalline direction um, as we wanted and, and, and we need for um, directed attachment. But uh, we found out that um, the icosahedral symmetry was, was again back. So the particles were round enough to have icosahedral symmetry, but now I see nothing. The black, black screen. screen. Okay. Ah, now it's coming it, now, Okay. Now it's rounded cube super particles. Exactly, uh, and the orientation has been determined as uh, as well. So in the next slide, what I'm showing the, with the color is that the the ones uh, the color co gives the orientation in space, and all the ones that are next to each other have the same color. So when we heat up this sample and get rid of the uh, the ligands, you get actually directed attachment in 3D, but with holes with icosahedral symmetry. And uh, we found exactly the same thing in the simulations. So now this is a very powerful way of going through directed attachment. Yes. Just, uh, just to briefly interrupt, uh, the, you have been talking for about 45 minutes, so I, yep. you can you please spend a few more minutes, yep. uh, but please be aware. Thanks. So we're not yet there when nature is, uh, some of you may, may have seen these, but these are amazing single uh, atomic uh, algae, a single um, uh, cellular algae that forms single crystals of uh, calcium carbonate uh, that are, are shaped like that. But let's just say we're, we're on our way. So now, and necessarily because of time, I'll be relatively quick on this. What happens if we do the self-assembly of a binary crystal? And we actually chose a crystal uh, that had very reminiscent uh, kind of hard sphere structural properties uh, that are reminiscent of uh, the stacking of ABC for FCC and ABA for ATP. But now this is a binary metallic system where the ABC kind of stacking forms a magnesium copper two crystal and the ABAB stacking a magnesium zinc two and then there is also magnesium um, uh, nickel too. To make a long story short, these free energies of these hard spheres with a size ratio of about 0.8 is very close to uh, each other as well. Why did we come up uh, with investigating these structures already over 10 years ago? That is because if uh, you look at the structure of this magnesium copper two in, in real space, then the big spheres, if you remove the small spheres, have a, a diamond lattice. And that is very interesting for photonic uh, applications. Unfortunately, the free energy of the magnesium zinc two, which is not optically very interesting, is tiny little bit bigger. I'll skip over the details of this phase diagram that was um, analyzed already over 10 years ago. So Da Wang did a lot of experiments. Tornista uh, Dasgupta did a lot of uh, trials to get binary simulation to work. And I just want to express that I'm going to go in the next few slides very quickly over their results. Uh, it took years and years to, to make the structures and to analyze them. And also Marilyn Baxter was instrumental in this uh, as well. So we, we in, together with the group of uh, Chris Murray, generated binary 0.8 sized, different sized semiconductors and did the self-assembly. In bulk, we indeed got what people always uh, reported on the nanoparticles magnesium zinc too, but very nicely, if we had the stoichiometry correct, we indeed found this five-fold symmetry again, which if you remember um, is indicative of this icosahedral ordering. Whether it's a icosahedral regular structure or a quasi-crystal, 
is something that I probably should uh, discuss if there is a question about it. But um, this is an ex uh, a realization of one of the simulations done by Das Gupta of 3000 particles. And when we analyzed uh, in the certain scattering direction, uh, the Fourier transform, so this is a projection of the 3D Fourier transform, it actually looked extremely similar to the quasi-crystal that was reported uh, in 1982 by Levine and, uh, and Steinhardt and um, um, a few months uh, earlier, of course, by um, uh, was, was also found uh, experimentally. So um, this icosahedral theme goes all the way also to binary uh, crystals. And why this is very interesting is because this icosahedral ordering has a much stronger uh, coupling with light if you would realize these structures, these binary structures also with uh, particles of several hundred nanometers in size. I do want to point out in the final slides that um, if you just are slightly off stoichiometry, and this is why it took also uh, da very many experiments to get all these structures, you get be beautiful superparticles of binary crystals, but no effect at all of the spherical confinement. And then it is as if you just have taken uh, a spherical cookie cutter out of a, a, a 3D binary crystal. Why we now think that that's happening is because the crystallization probably takes place, but then the slight off stoichiometry of the big or the small particles makes it that the effect of the wall is not felt. It took a long time um, to analyze also or to get these structures also to crystallize in uh, simulations. And this is one simulation run for very many weeks uh, that uh, Tunista analyzed. You actually saw a seeded growth of this um, icosahedral, which I think is a quasi crystal. And some of the referee is not convinced of this. So we're very uh, intrigued of finding out more on this, uh, uh, this work in the um, the coming years. So finally, a group is joking uh, that if I see something nice, uh, I'll put it in a droplet and I uh, let it slowly evaporate and then see what happens. Uh, well, it certainly becomes more spherical usually, uh, but also very interesting uh, physics results. So we've seen that the hard sphere system, which is one of the most studied condensed matter systems, still had a lot of surprises to give. We have seen that rounded cubes could give you um, interesting structures for directed 3D attachment, and that the icosahedral symmetry was also found back uh, for the, um, the nanoparticle systems. And we are now very eager to, to study that also with 100 nanometer sized particles in an ENW Groot uh, project. So those were the conclusions, uh, the papers you can uh, read over here, but hopefully I've also shown that um, there is not only a lot of room at the bottom, but there is even much more room at multiple length scales. So very quickly, I want to thank all also the staff of, of my group, uh, Marjolein, Arnaud, Marijn and Laura, very much the group uh, collaborations, great collaborations with Daniel van Maaklenberg, and we're starting now collaborations with Petra de Jong, but also the groups of Chris Murray and Sarah Bals, have been essential for uh, all the work I d discussed uh, today. So I'm sorry I went over uh, time a little bit and uh, hope there is still a little bit of time for questions.